Okay, welcome back. <clears throat> so, yeah, so this is the, the last lecture and we're going to just kind of summarise a little bit of what we've been learning um, and also talk about uh, you know, where to from here. So, we've been uh, practicing um, metta, and I guess it was, you know, as I was talking about over lunch, one of my learnings is that it's not enough just to have a dry practice of um, kind of escaping your problems by going into a state where you're not thinking anymore by just staying on the breath. Yes, that's incredibly helpful. Um, and potentially it could be, um, you know, definitely an avenue for some people um, because through that things will open up. But for most of us, we need uh, something more. And we talked right at the beginning about the two wings of the bird. There needs to be this um, unfolding of good qualities in our mind that we need to keep working on as well as the wisdom and understanding of how the mind works so we've got to look after those two uh, aspects and for me um, you know this search for deepening our understanding of the world in fact deepening our understand so much that it goes a little beyond just intellectual understanding. Um, I was talking to you at lunch about how someone might be touched by beautiful artwork. And you're asked, you know, well, you know, how do you find it so beautiful? I mean, we all agree it's beautiful, but how can you, how can that description, you know, how, what, what is it about it that is touching? And there's only a limited way you can sort of explain that. There's something beyond words when, when you're touching, being, being touched by something. And for me, you know, it's a little bit about trying to find meaning. We're, we're really, you know, the age-old question, what's the meaning of the universe? And there is meaning in the universe, but often it's beyond uh, explanation. But when we touch that meaning, it deepens, it shows there's another dimension to life apart from just things, there's like a verticality, a depth to life that deepens the way we look at life and changes very much the way we look at life. And very often, um, well, and I would say that that meaning has the essence of love, uh, meta anyway about it sort of compassion love that sort of thing and so one way into that is through your meta practice as well as developing all of these really good qualities it also deepens our um, engagement into life as a great mystery and that in turn helps us um, captivate the mind so that you know, we can more easily let go of aversion and attachment because they seem a little bit more peripheral. We're more detached from the things that normally cause us aversion and attachment because this deepening of the mystery of life and the meaning has so much more grasp. <clears throat> and that in turn helps our samadhi practice. And this mystery opens up and we start to see the emptiness of things. So, um, and as I said, the, the, just the practice of um, metta alone not only deepens our, my, um, our sense of the world, but as we do metta practice, some of us, um, as well as connecting into that almost physical energy of, of metta, um, we get a sense of spaciousness and when we get a sense of love in the universal sense when we were talking about that last uh, one last night about universe for all beings there's a sense of um, unification of everything and people often describe you know it's like love is everywhere 
you know, they feel love from the trees and from the birds and things like that. And so we start to sense um, this in our mind as and there's a sort of an interdependence between us and other. And then if we practice that for a time being, and some of you may have experienced it, if we can stay in that state long enough, it obviously results in a peaceful state of mind, and then it's much easier to work with those difficult people. Yeah? And we think to ourselves, why is it easier now suddenly, in this peaceful state of mind, to suddenly see those difficult people as, well, they're just struggling with their own fears and anxieties and ignorances. Whereas when we're more in an agitated state of mind, we can't seem to see the same logic. It just seems like they're, they're difficult people. <coughs> and what I suggest and what you may find is that the way we think depends on our state of being. And in NLP, um, I think I said this before, there are no unresourceful people, there's only unresourceful states. If you can get someone in a resourceful state, you can see much more resourcefully, you can see avenues which just open up, ways of thinking which open up, which you just never saw before. And the same with dealing with difficult people, you can see them from relative points of view, which allows you to drop away that aversion, forgive those people, let go and be done with that whole mess that, you know, was a whole chapter in your life. Now, I'll keep going with this because if we are able to see that our perception changes the way we are able to think, our perception is dependent on our state, um, then we see that we should avoid locking into any one particular perception because the way we see the world changes depending on the perception we're looking through at the, the current time. And we should stop reif reifying people. This has been a theme, is we tend to say, this person is just, he's like that. He'll always be like that. He's, you know, he has been always like that. He's never going to change. It's not true. All of us are changing from moment to moment. So, you know, I can be incredibly difficult one moment, and literally, the second later, I'm a different person. I'm a different person. You know, we've changed. We know that our physical body, uh, apart from our bones, I think the rest of our flesh changes every four or five weeks. You know, from what we consume, the old cells die, disappear, the new cells, and then within you know, a couple of months, we're, we're completely new flesh. So why can't we be completely new, new bodies if every single cell of us, except maybe our bones, has changed? So we stop locking into uh, perception. And all of this uh, points to a sense of emptiness of the person, in, which is the opposite of reifying the person. So rather than saying the person is like this, you realise it's completely changing all the time. Therefore, there's no real essence of a person. It's just a process. One way to look at emptiness is everything is just a process, just unfolding all the time process unfolding all the time. So, um, yeah, and this um, allows us insights into emptiness. So my point being that every, even a practice, if you become a metta practitioner, then, and metta is your primary practice, it will still guide you into a sense of, of emptiness. And in this way we're purifying our mind, and as our perceptions are purified, then the world we live in purifies as well. And many people report, similar to what Hugh Len said, that as you approach that more unified state, difficult people just stop coming into your life. Um, and I guess even if they did, you just don't see them as difficult people anymore. Uh, whereas when we reify, we lose flexibility and we stop growing. As soon as we think we know, yep, I know how the universe works, you've stopped. Because you're not then allowing yourself to grow anymore. Okay, so we get uh, stuck. Can I ask a question? 
Yes. What do you mean by sense of emptiness? Well, the opposite of reification. So you think you know who Peter Radcliffe is? Mm -hmm. At that point, it's stuck because you go, I, I got it, I know who he is. The truth is, I've changed since I started saying this sentence. I've changed. I'm not the same person. So then, who is Peter Radcliffe if I'm not the same person as I was a minute ago? You know? You could try to say I'm the continuation of the process. But I'm really not the same person. Yeah. So, they say you can't step in the same river twice. It looks like the same river and we label it that, but it's not really. It's a different river. And I know it sounds sort of a little academic at the moment, but that is the key to being able to let go of everything. That's the key to being able to be completely free of suffering. It's, uh, there's no point in having an opinion or a negative emotion towards something if an instant later it's changed. It's gone forever. It's impermanent. So therefore, you know, suffering likewise is empty and it's being created um, by people. All the time, moment by moment. Um, and then those people themselves are, are, have no, no self in themselves. Another way to look at it is, you know, we think we don't like, we, we make a judgment against a certain person or a certain cause, but every difficulty has millions of causes, you know? So I said earlier I used the example of Putin in this war, and he certainly is a central cause, but there are many, many causes, you know, like you could argue that Putin only sort of could have come to power in Russia. He may not have come to power in other countries because the structure is just not there for an authoritarian figure, possibly. But even Putin himself, he's a product of billions of causes throughout his childhood and probably before his childhood. So um, suffering has many, many causes. Again, another reason why we can't reify these things. So, um, this is sort of also a where to from here, is if you want to deepen your meta practice and you find that you know, you've come a long way with meta and you would like to go further but these meditations aren't doing it, you can actually swap to doing meditations on emptiness. And you've been to the emptiness retreat, was, it that, was that what we did? When we came here last time, you can't remember. I can't remember. <laughs> anyway, if not, you know, um, what, yes. what I'm, yeah, that's next retreat. So obviously what I'm doing is I'm doing metta, insight, or emptiness, same thing, and samadhi practice, okay? So if, you know, if you feel like you're stuck in one of these three, you can swap to the other one and become flexible. And when you, when you get very um, proficient with all three, that's what you can do in your meditation practice, is you can swap. And they help each other, they, they um, reaffirm each other. Can you just take one route and sort of gain insight into all three? Yes, you can. Um, but in practice, that's not as easy, I found personally, and from speaking to others, it's actually seems to be like you work on this side for a little bit, then you work in the middle here, and then you work on the right side, and they support each other, and it seems like you're able to more quickly go. So, so, uh, so the emptiness is, is, is retreat, is being held in June, uh, uh, and might be something you want to put in your diaries. Um, with Samadhi also, that's about absorbing into these energies. And the first act of samadhi is try to get rid of distraction so that you can stay on one object. And then the second is absorption. And to get true absorption, the mind 
need to, you need to remove restlessness. And in order to remove restlessness, the mind really needs something that it likes to be with in the present moment. And so this, if you achieve like a sense of meaning or a sense of purposefulness or a sense of love, or as I said, a sense of bliss because of the energy currents in the body, that enables the mind to go, oh, I like that, I'm gonna stay there. And it's so much easier to not think about, you know, what your daughters are doing at home or whatever it is, your distractions. And so samadhi practice becomes easier once you've had some progress in these other practices. But likewise, practicing samadhi will help you tune into the energy body, stay present, and when, you know, the grace of the divine gives you an inspiration, like Gosha said about the guy who was playing the trumpet, or if we have some sort of deepening in meta practice, it allows us to just sink into that and stay there, and it becomes much more meaningful and more powerful. Otherwise, the distracted mind straight away starts thinking about it. You go, oh, I feel like I can forgive that guy. And then the rational mind comes in and goes, well, actually, it's not that easy. Or, well, that's because you did this, this, and this. And you know, and, and you get thrown out of that feeling before it's really solidified to the unconscious mind. And so coming back and doing a samadhi retreat is also really, really helpful to practice that aspect of the path. Uh, yeah, and it opens us up to, to staying with that, which is very nourishing. So as of yet, I don't have any dates for a samadhi retreat. Um, that's something that if you're interested in, let me know because it's a bit of a sort of a catch-22. I need to know there's interest out there for me to schedule something. And then if, if there's interest out there, I schedule it and then I try to push for, for people to come along. But that's something that I want to do once enough interest is in the people doing concentration meditation or samadhi meditation. Um, yeah, so that's um, really in terms of the, the, the whole gambit of the meditation retreats. Of course, uh, if you want to, if you are more of someone who likes logic and structure, then of course the NLP practices are perfect. And I think they're great anyway, because, you know, they teach you so much, like they're just so powerful. But most of all, we again, look at how all of these patterns created in our mind, pattern after pattern after pattern, how to reprogram it. Another pattern, how to reprogram it. You know, part conflict, you know, getting when we feel conflicted, when we have negative emotions, they're just patterns. When we make limiting decisions, they're just patterns. When we get anchored, it's just a pattern. You know, whether we're visual, auditory, or kinesthetic, it's just a pattern we run. What our meta programs are, whether we're an introvert or an extrovert, it's a pattern. And you can rewire or change all of those things. And so by doing that, suddenly you realize how flexible the mind is and we talked about neuroplasticity. And then of course, for those of you who are interested, next June, there's the sort of jewel in the crown, which is the Bali retreat, which Tracy's been on, which is sort of a bit of everything. It's a bit of self development. In, a, in an absolutely luxurious place in Bali, so we would love to see you there. All right, so that's really a wrap up of those options that um, you can go for if you want to keep going, you know, with us. So, any last questions for the retreat? I would say forever hold your peace, but of course you're welcome to email me at any point in the future if you have <laughs> questions. But for now, is there anything that I can clear up in regards to meta? <laughs>